بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد in our uh, last week's halaqa, we had discussed the infamous incident of the satanic verses, and we had mentioned uh, the number of opinions, and uh, Allahu A'lam, but it appears that there was no such story. And the fact of the matter is that the Quraysh prostrated simply because of the power of Surat An najm And this rumor, as we said, led to the Muslims uh, to return back from Abyssinia, and they, when they came back, they discovered that this rumor was false. Now, Number of points here, uh, before we get back to the actual story. The question arises about the number of people who immigrated the first time to Abyssinia and who was and who was not a part of that initial batch. Now we're not going to go over all of the opinion, that's a little bit too advanced. But the main point is that from the immediate Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ, of course the greatest companion is Abu Bakr, right? We'll discuss his case. Umar, at this point, why didn't Umar immigrate to Abyssinia? Who can tell me? He wasn't even a Muslim yet. Okay. Uthman, is he immigrating to Abyssinia? Yeah. Yes. He was of those he immigrated. And then who is left? Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali at this age, at this stage, is still a young child, really. You know, he's, uh, he's probably at this, at this stage, he's probably around 9, 10 years old. So the question of Ali immigrating could not come about. Okay. Therefore, out of the Sahaba, the only two, out of the four, let's say the main Sahaba, the only two who qualify are Abu Bakr and Uthman. Uthman immigrated. How about Abu Bakr? We didn't mention his story. The story of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr initially decided to immigrate. And he decided to accompany Uthman and the people to go to Abyssinia. But on the way to uh, the ship, on the way to Jeddah, he, they passed by the neighboring tribe, the leader of that tribe was Ibn al-Daghina. Ibn al-Daghina was the leader of that tribe. And the tribe name is not known, so we're not, uh, is not known to us here, so we're not going to confuse you more with more and more names. The main point is the leader or the chief Ibn al-Daghina, he saw all of them leaving. So, and they packed their bags, they have all of the camels loaded. So he said, where are you going? So they said, we're going to Abyssinia. He said, why? So they explained, where our, our people have tortured us, they have not allowed us to worship, and we are all going to a land where we can worship Allah. Now Ibn al-Daghina had used to have a good partnership with Abu Bakr in buying and selling. He was somebody whom Abu Bakr knew personally. So Ibn al-Daghina, when he saw out of all of these people, he picked on Abu Bakr, and he said, someone like you does not deserve to leave the land of Mecca. And if your people have persecuted you, then let me intercede on your behalf. And let me go and talk to them and give you my protection. Now remember, the whole Jahili system is based on who's going to protect who, right? And the tribe of Abu Bakr has basically accepted that they're not going to protect Abu Bakr anymore. Okay? And so Ibn al-Daghina said, let me go and negotiate on your behalf. And maybe they'll take my protection so that they're not going to harm you. And so Abu Bakr said, okay, let's give it a try. So Abu Bakr and Ibn al-Daghina returned back. The rest of the Sahaba emigrated to Abyssinia. And Ibn al-Daghina entered Mecca and he approached the Kaaba. And it was the time that everybody sits. As we said many, many times, they had an afternoon time where basically when it's, everything is over in the day, you come and you sit in front of the Kaaba. And Ibn al-Daghina announced that, O oh people of Mecca, would you accept it if I offered my protection to Abu Bakr? Now notice, he cannot do so instantaneously because it's the land of Mecca. And Ibn Daghina is not from the Quraysh, he's from another tribe, right? And so it's like a neighboring country saying, this is our citizen, can he live amongst you? And he has our rights. It's as if he's my tribe member. So this is an adoption, if you like, right? So Ibn Daghina said, I'll adopt Abu Bakr, let him live amongst your own people. Like basically, imagine America going to Canada, the Canadian government saying to America that, okay, look, forget his American citizenship, pretend he's a Canadian, right? That's basically what's happening here. That Ibn Daghina is saying that, let me offer my protection to Abu Bakr, but then he needs the permission of the Quraysh. Are you going to accept? And Ibn Daghina was a trading partner. Ibn Daghina was the chieftain of a neighboring tribe, uh, the, the tribe that is next to, to Mecca. And so they basically had to agree because it's a neighboring tribe. And they wanted to just make him happy. So they said, okay, we will accept your protection for Abu Bakr. And therefore Abu Bakr did not emigrate because of Ibn Daghina. However, they said to Ibn Daghina, 
They said to Ibn Dagina, we're only going to allow this with one condition. And that is Abu Bakr cannot pray publicly. Because Abu Bakr was of the elite of the Quraysh and before this he would pray in front of the Kaaba. And he was of the few people who was brave to pray in front of the Kaaba. Everything changed with the conversion of Umar. When Umar converted, then Muslims could pray in front of the Kaaba. Before that time, you had to be a really brave person. And it was really only the Prophet who would regularly pray. Once in a while, Abu Bakr joined him. So they said, you have to, we're not going to allow Abu Bakr to pray publicly. And if he agrees to this, we'll agree to your protection that he can do as he pleases in private, but not in public. And therefore the Quraysh agreed and Abu Bakr agreed. And therefore what he decided to do was, he was the first person to ever build a masjid. This is what it says, the first person to build a masjid. He didn't build a masjid structure, he basically extended his house and he made a room into his place of worship. Right? Because they didn't allow him to worship publicly, so he decided to make a public masjid. Right? He's using the loopholes here. So he builds an extension of the house, and he begins praying in that extension. And he prays out loud because it's his house, and the condition was he can pray in his house. Right? So he's basically reading through the lines here. He builds an extension, he makes a masjid, and then he starts praying out loud in his house, which is a now a masjid. Obviously, what's going to happen? The people, Abu Bakr's tilawa was a very gentle tilawa. And Abu Bakr's recitation of the Quran was a very melodious recitation. And Ibn Ishaq says, the women and the children would gather around in amazement listening to Abu Bakr's recitation, because it was a, a beautiful recitation. And uh, his own daughter Aisha tells us that Abu Bakr kana rajulan bakka'an. He was a man who very easily began to cry. And he would weep from the fear of Allah. And so when he recited the Quran, he would cry. And he would beg Allah for forgiveness. So it's a very emotional uh, recitation. So the people began to gather around his house every time he's praying. You know, it's a small city, it's a quiet time at night, you're reading uh, Fajr or Maghrib or Isha or Tahajjud, anybody walking by can hear you. You know, it's dead silent, it's not like the city. You know, it's like the houses are far, far away. It's a small, you know how it used to be in those days. Many of you might remember from back home, still houses are small, narrow alleyways. So Abu Bakr's recitation is going five blocks, let's say, right? Because that's what a block is for them. You know, each houses are there. So people people began gathering outside of his house. Now technically the condition was he could read in his house. And that's what he did. But this got to a point where they sent a messenger to Ibn al -Daghina. And they said, we have to take back our condition. He cannot even pray in his house. SubhanAllah. We have to take back our condition. He cannot even pray in his house. You have to tell him to stop praying even in his house. So Ibn al daghina came to Mecca. When the messenger came, Ibn al daghina came to Mecca. And he said to Abu Bakr that, Oh Abu Bakr, uh, I have no choice except to ask you to stop praying even. Or allow me out of this protection because I can't give you that type of protection. Right? You have one of two choices. That you either stop praying or... I can't protect you anymore. Obviously, I don't need to tell you which one Abu Bakr chose, right? So he said, I throw back your protection to you and I accept the protection of Allah. I throw back your protection to you that you're free now. You have done your job. I, you, you did it now. You couldn't you know, stand up basically because Ibn Dahana didn't fight at all. He just basically agreed. And in one sense, we understand because it's not his territory. It's not his. And he's really going out of his way to help Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr said, okay, you know, Thanks, but no thanks. Take your protection back, and I trust in the protection of Allah. And after this, he was in Mecca without any protection other than the protection of Allah. And that is why uh, I told the story two weeks ago that when Abu Bakr came to protect the Prophet, they almost beat him to death. And nobody lifted a finger because he was not under anybody's protection. Right? I told you the story two weeks ago that somebody came and tried to choke the Prophet Abu Bakr came and, and pulled it out and I said, an Rabbi Allah. Are you going to kill a person just because he said Allah is my Lord? And they began beating him until he was uh, the equivalent of hospitalized. He was immobilized for more than a week and he could not move in his house because of the severity of beating. How could they get away with this even though Abu Bakr was Qurashi? Because his own sub-tribe had basically withdrawn and Ibn Daghina had withdrawn. So now he is a homeless person and he's living at his own risk and he continued to live at his own risk 
until the Prophet ﷺ uh, emigrated to Medina. Now we already mentioned that around uh, 14, some say 15, some say 16, some say 17, between 14 to 17 people emigrated. Allahu alam, the strongest uh, opinion would be 12 men and 5 women. So that's a total of 17. 12 men and 5 women. So we, heard, we, we talked about the fact they heard the rumor, they came back. As they're coming back, they're eagerly asking, have the people of Mecca accepted? Have the people of Mecca accepted? They're waiting for a caravan to get the news before they get to Mecca. The first caravan they meet, they ask. And the people of the caravan said, you have heard false. This is not the case. The people of Mecca are as they were, and the, the, the new religion is being persecuted. And so this jolted them. This was a big shock for them. So much so that some of them said, let's just go back. Before entering Mecca, let's just go back. Now can you imagine, put yourself in their shoes, Mecca is right in front of you, right? This is your homeland, your relatives, your possession, everything is there. Literally, you're just one step away. And now, debate occurs, should we go back or not? Until obviously, emotionally, psychologically, they said, look, we're so close, let's just go back and see what the situation is like, right? Life would have been very tough. As we said, imagine a different culture, a different language. They don't speak Abyssinian. It's a whole different land, whole different environment. It's much worse than we can imagine. And I forgot to mention one point when I mentioned this issue, that SubhanAllah, one of the punishments of Islamic law, which is no longer practiced pretty much anywhere in the world, because the world has changed. And this shows us sometimes change is permissible. One of the punishments of Islamic law for certain crimes is called at taghrib at taghrib means leave your land and go somewhere else. If you're from, let's say, uh, the Hijaz, go live in the Najd. If you're from the Najd, you know, go live in Syria or someplace, right? One of the punishments for certain types of petty crimes, right? That you're not going to be whipped, you're not going to be jailed, j just go live somewhere else for a year. That was a punishment. Well, in our times, that's not a punishment, it's sightseeing, right? This is a vacation. You're telling me to go for a year, it's a vacation, okay. So look at how times have changed, that to leave your society, to leave your land, was a type of punishment. And so the Sahaba had to self-inflict this punishment when they went to Abyssinia. When they come back, they decided, okay, let's just go see what is happening in Mecca. Now, when they left Mecca, they had basically... Again, I'm speaking in modern equivalent, they had cancelled their passports. <coughs> they had re renegated from their tribe. Because that's the whole point now. So when they go back in, they cannot just expect the same protection. So each one of them has to find new protection. Each one of them has to find a new sponsor. Like what's going to be my entry visa to get into Mecca? And we have some stories about what happened here. Uthman ibn Madhun. Uthman ibn Madhun. One of the famous Sahaba, and he has a lot of stories in the seerah, and he died an early death uh, in one of the battles of Shaheed. Uthman ibn Madhrun reached out to Al Walid ibn al Mughira, the same one who is the famous poet, because he had a friendship with him. And Al Walid ibn al Mughira agreed. And so Al Walid marched with him, and they publicly announced this is how they enacted treaties. They publicly announced Al Walid said, I have given my protection to Uthman ibn Madhrun. And so Uthman remained completely protected. Walid is one of the most powerful men in Mecca. We already said Allah revealed verses in the Quran. This is the father of who? Khalid ibn al-Walid. This is the father of Khalid, right? This is the one whom Allah revealed Surah Muddathir. ذَرْنِي وَمَنْ خَلَقْتُ وَحِيدًا وَجَعَلْتُ لَهُ مَالًا مَمْدُودًا وَبَنِينَ شُهُودًا All of this Allah is talking about. This is al-Walid. The one who fakkara uh, waqaddar, he thought, what am I going to say about the Prophet ﷺ? And then he said, this is a strange type of magic. This is Al-Walid, one of the most powerful men, rivaling Abu Jahl. So Al-Walid gave protection to Uthman. And because this is Walid, Uthman, not a hair on his head was touched. Now, Ibn Ishaq says, when Uthman would go back and forth in the city, and he would see the Muslims being persecuted, and he would see that he himself was untouched, his guilt began to get the better of him, even though he's not doing anything wrong. And he said, how come they are suffering and I am in safety? How come they are suffering and I am in safety? So one day he went to Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira and he said that, oh my uncle, Walid is a senior man, elder man, oh my uncle, please take your protection back. Your jiwar is called the protection. Just take back your jiwar. So Al-Walid said, my nephew, what has happened? Has anybody harmed you? 
Is, have I not done my, my service? I mean, is anything, you know, why do you want to return it? It's a very obviously big thing. You know, why do you want to return it? So he said, I cannot bear to see my fellow brothers and sisters suffer while I have this freedom. SubhanAllah. Look at, now there's nothing sinful per se about, uh, about uh, Uthman's situation. But his conscience was so strong, he said, why do I have, just because I have a friendship with Walid from the days of Jahiliyyah, now he's protecting me. How about the rest of the people? How about Ibn Mas'ud? How about Bilal? How about even the other uh, uh, people who returned from Abyssinia and who didn't get the protection I got? It's not fair. And so he voluntarily returned Al-Walid's protection. And Al-Walid came and to the Kaaba and, and he said that, O people of Mecca, Uthman has asked that I return his protection to him. And uh, Uthman announced that, yes, I have done this and it's not because of any issue of Al-Walid. He wants to make sure that people don't think that Al-Walid fell, fell short. It's because I have my own reasons. It's nothing to do with Al-Walid. So, okay, announcement is made. And they're not going to just jump and attack on him. I mean, okay, the announcement is made. Now he comes walking back and he passes by a very famous poet who was visiting Mecca at the time. One of the most famous poets, so much so he is of the, uh, uh, the Mu'allaqat, or he is of the poets who has written the most famous poetry in pre-Islam. And uh, he is one of those poets who eventually accepted Islam. Eventually, right now he's not a Muslim. He's one of the few of the mighty poets, if you like, who eventually accepted Islam. His name is Labid. His name is Labid. And he passed by and Labid was sitting on the majlis and all the people of Quraysh were surrounded. You know the poetry, you know, the, this is their entertainment, right? So Labid is reciting poetry. And Labid was not from the Quraysh, he was a visitor. They had invited him for their festival. So Labid is reciting poetry and so he begins to listen. Labid says, and he recites a line of poetry, Ala kullu shay'in ma khalallaha batilu. Now, pause here, footnote. The Prophet ﷺ said, the most truthful statement that any poet has ever said is this statement of Al-Walid. The Prophet ﷺ said, he, he quoted this. One of the few lines of poetry the Prophet ﷺ actually quoted. He hardly quoted poetry. But this is one of the lines he quoted. In fact, it's half a line, uh, half a stanza. And so what does it mean? It means, verily, everything other than Allah is useless. Ala kullu shay'in ma khalallaha batilu. Right? So he said this line. And so he's very impressed. Meaning Uthman. Eventually Labid accepted Islam. But right now he's a mushrik. So obviously you're happy. He's very impressed. And he said, Sadaqta. You have spoken the truth. Everything besides Allah is useless. The only thing that's worthy to concentrate on and to make an ultimate goal is Allah. Everything besides Allah is just Useless. And then he said, وَكُلُّ نَعِيمٍ And every single blessing, لَا مَحَالَةَ زَائِلُ Without any doubt, it will disappear. Every enjoyment will disappear. Now, Uthman's heart had gone so high, that what a beautiful line of poetry. Then he said something that he didn't agree with. So he said, كَذَبْتَ You have just lied. Because Jannah will never disappear. Right? This is, yani the, 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 the line of poetry is that everything besides Allah is useless. And every pleasure, there is no doubt about it, will come to an end. And here Uthman said, no, you're lying. The pleasures of Jannah will never come to an end. Now this is in a large, you imagine this, you know, this is the dignitary, this is the VIP, right? All of the Quraysh around him. His, he has just withdrawn his protection, right? And right then and there, literally on the way back, because they had the, the Nadi over there, on the way back he utters this statement. And Labid gets irritated. I mean, he, he is the guest of honor here. And he said, since when have you treated your guests with this matter? I mean, if you stand up and, you know, a speaker has come from another place, since when have you, this is rude. I am your guest, you've invited me to recite my poetry and now, now he doesn't know what's going on obviously. Labid doesn't know that Uthman is a Muslim and he doesn't understand all of this, right? So he considers Uthman a heckler in the audience, right? You understand this, right? And so he says to the Quraysh, since when has this become your custom that you heckle your, uh, your, your, your visitors? 
And so somebody stood up in anger and gave him a hard smack and basically gave him a black eye. And his left eye became completely swollen and he went home and when Al-Walid heard, Al-Walid came rushing to his house and said, my nephew, why did, you, why did you get rid of my protection? I mean, I could have, you know, it's, it's foolishness. Come, come back with me, I'll give it back to you. I mean, you see what's happening here. And so uh, uh, Uthman responds that, no, this is not a problem at all. Verily, and this is a classic line of, of Uthman. He said, verily, my other eye is now in need of the blessings that this eye has gotten. My other eye is jealous now. It needs to get the same thing as this eye. And he refused to get back under the protection of uh, Al-Walid. And this shows us that SubhanAllah, I mean, uh, some of the Sahaba did get that protection. Some of them remained in it, right? And this shows us people are at different levels. And there's nothing wrong with those who remained. But some of them did not feel comfortable and so they returned their protection. Uh, of those who kept the protection is uh, Abu Salama. Of course, Abu Salama is the husband of Umm Salama. Abu Salama is going to die shortly and the Prophet is going to marry Umm Salama. Right? So this is that Abu Salama. So Abu Salama returned back because Abu Salama and Umm Salama migrated first and then they migrated again as we're going to talk about. There were two migrations to Abyssinia as we're going to talk about. So Abu Salama comes back. Abu Salama is actually a cousin of the Prophet but he's a cousin from his mother's side, not the father's side. So Abu Salama is not Banu Hashim. Abu Salama is actually Banu Makhzum. Banu Makhzum is Abu Jahl. Right? Abu Salama is from the tribe of Abu Jahl. But his mother is the aunt of the Prophet i.e. Abdullah's sister. Right? You guys following? Abdullah's sister is Abu Salama's mother. So... Abu Salama doesn't want to reach out to Abu Jahl. I mean, come on, Abu Jahl is not going to give me protection. So who can he reach out to? His uncle from his mother's side. Who is? Who is? Abu Talib. Abu Talib, right? Abu Talib is his mother's brother. So he sends a message to Abu Talib that, look, can you basically sponsor me? You know, can you get me into your tribe, basically protection? So Abu Talib said, of course, yes. Now, what do you think Abu Jahl is going to do when he hears that somebody else has taken one of his tribe members? Who do you think you are? So, a delegation comes from Banu Maghzum to the house of Abu, J uh, Abu Talib again. You're interfering in our politics. This is our guy, right? Who do you think you are to offer him protection? Because it's a matter of honor, it's a matter of snubbing their nose, basically, right? And so, Abu Jahl and others, they get angry at Abu Talib. And Abu Talib said, well, if I'm going to give protection to one nephew, meaning the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, why can't I give protection to the other nephew? Meaning Abu Salama. I mean, if I'm going to protect one, why can't I protect the other? And so they were not, they were not going to budge and they surrounded his house and an argument broke out. And then Allah brought about a solution from a source we would never expect. Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab stood up and he said, have you not irritated this old man enough? I mean, Abu Talib is a senior figure. You know, he's an elderly person. Abu Lahab is now feeling compassion for his brother. Not because he loves the Prophet ﷺ, but just as a brother. Because after all, they are brothers, you know. And so he stood up and he said, Have you not irritated this old man enough? Let him be. Utrukuhu. Come on, let him be. How much are you going to pester this guy? Let him be. For wallahi, if you're going to continue, then I'm going to have to force my side. I'm going to choose him. This is Abu Lahab speaking. Right? And he's not speaking out of a love for Islam. He's speaking out of his love for his tribe and the protection of his chieftain. Right? And as we said, that type of love is not going to help you in Islam. Even Abu Talib loved the Prophet ﷺ, but not a religious love. It was a love of uncle. It was a love of a fatherly figure. It was a love of a fellow Hashemite. But it was not a religious love that we have for our Messenger He didn't have that religious love. He had a paternal love. And that love is not going to necessarily save you from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though it helped a little bit for Abu Talib's case. So Abu Jahl, uh, sorry, um, Abu Lahab stood up and defended against Abu Jahl, can you imagine the amazing scene here, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses whomever He chooses to help this religion. Somebody like Abu Lahab, 
have, there have been more than one time where he's done small things that have brought some benefit to Islam even though he didn't do it for the sake of Islam. And our Prophet ﷺ said in Medina many years later, he said, Verily, Allah can help this religion from a kafir, from a pagan. Allah can help, Allah will help, sorry is a better translation. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَيُؤَيُّذُ هَذَا الدِّينَ Allah sometimes helps this religion from a person who is not even a believer of it. And this, these types of incidents, they demonstrate uh, the, the truth of what the Prophet ﷺ said. So the point being that the situation in Mecca remained uh, status quo. It didn't change at all. And the Quraysh continued to persecute the Muslims. And so the initial batch that had immigrated from Abyssinia came together and decided, what do we do now? And the bulk of them said, let's go back. It was a mistake to come back. Now, let us go back. But in the meantime, they had stayed in Mecca two, three weeks. And the news spread amongst all of the Muslims about how good life was in Abyssinia, at least in terms of physical harm. Yes, it was difficult culturally and language and uh, climate, but not hostile. And you know, in the end of the day, you know, if you're living, uh, as we said, the two be best blessings that Allah gives, الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَأَمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ Right? These are the biggest blessings that Allah gives after Iman. And they had that in Abyssinia. They had food and they had safety. These are the best blessings. And so when they heard this, a large percentage of Muslims, we don't know how many Muslims were in Mecca at the time, it's not, there were no census, but it is probably correct to say that at least 30-40% of the Muslims of Mecca, if not 50%, decided to immigrate. Now that's a huge number, right? And yani half of your people are now leaving. Half of the Muslims are leaving. It's a huge number. And so, it is as if, and this is my opinion and Allah knows best, the wisdom why Allah allowed these early Muslims to come back only to return was so that the bulk of the Muslims or a large group of Muslims would then be convinced to travel to Abyssinia. Because as we all know, the number one way to be convinced is what? Word of mouth. Word of mouth. It's the number one way to actually be convinced. My friend told me, Right? That's the number one way. And there was no other way that so many Muslims would have emigrated to Abyssinia. No way. Unless Allah allowed the very Muslims who benefited to come back, tell the people status quo, and then people were convinced. And so, for the second immigration, more than 80 Muslims emigrated. That's more than quadruple the number that went the first time. More than 80 Muslims migrated and this time they were headed by Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the direct, obviously, cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now, please note though, of that initial batch of 17, not all of them returned in the 80. 17 went and came back. Some of those decided to remain. The most famous person who remained, Uthman ibn Affan. Uthman ibn Affan decided to remain and he then immigrated to Medina, he participated in Badr and Uhud and all of the rest of the, uh, the, the, the battles. So Uthman ibn Affan did not go back the second time, right? Of course Abu Salama, Umm Salama went back and Abu Salama then passed away over there. Uh, other Sahaba that did not go back, it is said that Mus'ab ibn Umair, the famous Mus'ab ibn Umair, who was the first to immigrate to Medina, Right, the first person who the Prophet had sent to Medina because his own parents had tortured him the worst torture, his own mother and father. So the Prophet first sent him to Abyssinia, then when he came back he decided that he wanted to stay with the Prophet So he stayed with the Prophet but then within three years, before the immigration that he himself did the Prophet he sent Mus'ab. As soon as the first batch of Muslims accepted Islam, the Prophet said to, to Mus'ab, go to Medina and you can live there. So Mus'ab also did not return to Abyssinia. Other Sahaba as well, some of them returned, some of them didn't. Now, when over 80 people, and Mecca at this time probably had only a few hundred people in it, right? So 80 people in Mecca represents more than 15%, 20% of the people of Mecca. It's a percentage of the city. Remember, Mecca is not a thriving metropolis. It is composed of, what, and I said this way back in the beginning, when we say tribe, don't think a thousand people. Think more like 10. Look at the Banu Hashim. There were 10 brothers. Right? There were 10 brothers, the descendants of uh, Abdul Muttalib. That's all they were, 10 brothers. 
So it, don't think of like massive. No, these are small sub-tribes. And there's only six or seven sub-tribes of the Quraysh. So you do the math. Again, we don't have census records. But there were for sure, there were not more than a thousand people in Mecca. For sure. Of that, th if, and that's if there were a thousand. Most likely they were even 600, 500. Out of that, 80 are migrating. I mean, that's like more than 10% of your population. Right? And it's a big embarrassment. That your own people are leaving. This is unprecedented in all of Arabia. You never have your own tribes men migrate out of your tribe. It's a huge embarrassment. And this is the Quraysh, the one that is the strongest tribe, the most elite, the most protective, the, the, the custodians of the Haram. And now they have 10-15% of their own tribes people emigrate. This is a shame. And they cannot bear this. And so, when they immigrated to Abyssinia, now the Quraysh decided, we cannot allow this emigration, we need to stop it. We need to stop it. So what did they do? They decided to send two people to Abyssinia. And appeal directly to the Najashi. Najashi is the title of the person who rules Abyssinia. Like Caesar is the title of the ruler of Rome, like Pharaoh is the title of the ruler of Egypt. This is not the name. Najashi is not his name. And in fact, his name was Al-Suhuma. His name was Al-Suhuma. The name of the Najashi uh, with a sad and a ha. Al-Suhuma. This is what we have narrated. And by the way, the grave of Najashi, of Al-Suhuma, is still well known to this day. And some of my uh, friends have visited it. I have not gone to that land, but some of my friends have visited it. They said this is a well-known, the grave of Najashi uh, is uh, well-known in the, in the land of Abyssinia. So, they sent two delegates, Amr ibn al-As and another person. Scholars have differed who that second person was. Amr ibn al-As, for those of you who know who he is, you know who he is. Who, those who don't know who he is, he was a very intelligent and shrewd politician. And when he accepted Islam, he retained that know-how of how to rule. And he became Muawiyah's main advisor, Amr ibn al-As. And of course, he's a companion, so we say nothing but good about him. But at this stage, he's not a Muslim, obviously. And he was a very cunning person at this stage. Later on, Iman came, and so alhamdulillah, he accepted Islam. And as a Sahabi, we say nothing but good of him. But he had that mind of a politician. And he was... He had that blood in him. He had that, uh, that prestige of being a, a ruler in him. This is Amr ibn al-As here. So Amr ibn al-As was sent by the Quraysh because they know who he is. And they sent one more person with him. So they traveled all the way to Abyssinia. Now, Umm Salama, who was to become uh, our mother, Umm Salama has left us many reports about life in Abyssinia and about the details. And alhamdulillah, we thank Allah for this because uh, she's the main reporter of the events of Abyssinia. And Umm Salama uh, narrated, and this is in Sahih Bukhari, Umm Salama narrated, when we landed in Abyssinia, this is the second hijrah, when we landed in Abyssinia, we were treated very hospitably with the by the Negus. He granted us security in our religion. He allowed us to worship Allah without persecution or any hindrance. In fact, we did not even hear one ridicule against us by the people. You know that when you're a minority in a majority, usually there's racial slurs, usually there's, uh, look at what's happening in America now, right? You know, these people are taking our jobs, they're this, they're that, you know what's happening, you know, it's a common thing. Uh, so, Umm Salam is saying that we didn't even hear one word spoken against us. But then the Quraysh heard of our status, that we have Izzah. And so they plotted against us and they decided to send two strong men. By strong she meant people who would do their job, not physically strong. That two strong men. And they gave them precious gifts. They loaded them with gifts. What were the gifts of Mecca? Primarily uh, leather skins. Mecca was known for a special type of camel leather, which was obviously, I mean, you're not going to get that type of leather in Abyssinia. And so Mecca was very well known for exporting. The main export of Mecca was that type of leather. The main export of Medina always was dates. So they sent all, all of these luxurious camel skins and many other gifts. And the two uh, dignitaries, emissaries, arrived in Abyssinia. The first thing that they did was they went to all of the viziers, the ministers of Najashi, and they gave each of them expensive gifts and leather, basically bribed them. 
They gave each of them expensive gifts and letter. And they said to them that we have in your midst a group of renegades and rebels. And we will speak to the Najashi tomorrow about their case and we want you to hand them back to us and support us in this cause. So basically this is open bribery. Okay, this is open bribery. And so make sure that you help us out in this regard. When we give the Negus his gifts, remember our gifts to you. Because they're going to bribe the Negus tomorrow. And subhanAllah, look at the hatred really of the Quraysh here that they can't even bear to see the Muslims live in a foreign land. It affects them that they have so much uh, freedom. So, the next day, they approached the Negus. And they said, some foolish youth from amongst our nation have emigrated to your country. They have left our religion and they have not embraced your religion. They've invented a new religion. They have left our religion and they have neither embraced your religion nor any of the other religions that we are aware of. And the leaders of our community have sent us to you in order that you hand these young foolish people back to us so that we can deal with them because we are more knowledgeable of their faults than anybody else. And so they presented the Negus with lots of fine gifts and incense and they presented them with all of these uh, leather uh, goods. And subhanAllah, this is the reality of, in our times we call this lobbying basically, right? In our times we call this lobbying, that you go and you give politicians money. And when you give them money for their campaigns, for their funds, and this is perfectly legal in this land, as you know. It's perfectly, in fact, that's the way the system works, right? And subhanAllah, just as a comment here, it's not directly related to the seerah, it's a comment here. SubhanAllah, our religion is so perfect that our Prophet Sallallahu before all of this modern system came about, our Prophet strictly forbade what we now call lobbying. Strictly, with the most harshest words. You're not allowed to give a public servant money. You're not allowed to. In our religion, I'm talking about in an Islamic state, we're not allowed to give the employees of the state any money at all. Their money comes from the treasury, from the state, because they're employees. They have no right to get any money from you because that is going to sway them from their job, right? This is basically the essence of bribery. And subhanAllah, in this land, this is not called bribery, it's called lobbying. It's completely legit. Even though, and this is the, the irony here, if you pay them money directly to their pocket, this is bribery. But if you pay to their campaign, this is, or you pay something else, this is lobbying. And they just have their ways uh, around it. Uh, you all know the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that he appointed somebody to go collect zakat, right? And the zakat collector came back, and he said, all of this is for you. And I was given a gift of something small. I was given, this is my gift, right? This is my lobbying I got. The Prophet ﷺ became so enraged that he stood up and he called the people to come to the masjid. And he gave a khutbah in the middle of the day, not on Friday. He gave a khutbah about this. And he said, what is wrong with some of you? He didn't mention the person because he did, never did that. What is wrong with some of you? That we appoint him to do a job and we, get, we pay his salary and then he comes back and he says, this is for you and this gift is for me. And then the Prophet said something that is very, very blunt but it shows how angry he was. Why didn't this man sit in his mother's house and see if a gift would then come to him? This is wallahi the essence of Islamic political science. Why didn't he sit in his house and then see if somebody would give him a gift, right? You have no right for the public's money. You're getting paid to do your job, do it. You're not getting paid to take the people's gifts and, and, and take a cut from them, right? But subhanAllah, the way that you know, other systems work, it's a completely different system and, and, and that's why money talks in this part of the world. And that's why if you have money, you will be able to get things passed, even at the highest levels of, of, of political power. And if you don't have money, even if the truth is on your side, and so the Quraysh know this tactic very well. And they're basically greasing the hands of Najashi and all of the, uh, and all of the people there. Now notice here, they are frightening the Najashi by religious differences, political differences, social differences, and perhaps even some scholars say economic uh, bribery and differences. Religious differences, the Najashi and his followers are all Christian. So they come and they say, these guys are religious fanatics. They're neither our religion nor yours, they're a cult. Social differences, they say they have broken away from the elders. They're a bunch of youngsters. 
They're just dismissing them. Economic differences, well, perhaps not differences, but they're attempting to bribe. And some scholars uh, try to say that, and Allah knows how true this is, that uh, there was also insinuation that the economic treaties between Abyssinia and Mecca would be weakened. And Allah knows how true this is. Political as well, that these are a group of strangers. We don't know what's going to happen. We can control them, send them back to us. And every government in power is scared of unknowns. Every government is scared of unknowns. And so they're trying to frighten Najashi religiously, socially, politically, culturally. These guys are all weirdos. And to this day, that's the common tactic. That these people, we don't know what they are and who they are. So when they finished their petition, the vizier stood up. They've been bribed. And they said, O oh, our ruler, verily what they have said makes complete sense. These are strangers in our land. We don't know anything about them. Return them back to their people. Let them deal with their affairs. SubhanAllah, money talks. Right? They were bribed and they listened to the bribe. So the viziers, all of them that had been bribed, stood up and agreed with the, uh, with the two Qurashis. Najashi said, No, by Allah, I cannot just hand them back. After they have chosen my land. Now remember, when they entered Abyssinia, even though the books don't mention this, but it must have happened, they must have sent a petition to Najashi asking permission to live. Because there's no other way you can live in that land. And Najashi must have granted that petition. Even though the books of Sirah don't explicitly write it out, but it's understood. There's no other way. So Najashi is aware of what's happening, that there's a group here from, from Mecca. So he, so he said, these people have chosen me over all the other lands they could have chosen. And they ask for my protection. The least that I can do is to listen to their side of the story. SubhanAllah, look, he's a king. He doesn't need to listen to 80 people, right? But what did the Prophet say? Malikun Adil. Didn't he say that? He's a just king. And a just king will listen to both sides and decide what is right and wrong. Did not decide what is in his power or what is in his benefit. So he said, I will not return them back until I listen to them. He didn't say, I'm not going to return them back. He said, let me see what they have to say. And then we'll make up our minds. I can't just, and subhanAllah, look at this. I mean, this is way before we have modern law. Najashi has common sense. That you have to listen to both sides of the story. And so, Najashi says that we need to listen to their, listen to their side. And this shows us how true the Prophet was when he said he is a just king. And it also shows us that when Allah is on your side, Allah will plot and plan no matter what the others plot and plan. وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ So the Niga sent a messenger. Najashi sent a messenger to Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. And they said, he said, come all of you to the palace tomorrow and explain to us why your people are opposed to you. Now, they had never seen the Najashi. Najashi is the king, right? They had never had any direct contact with him. Now they're being told, the emperor himself wants to meet you. Come to the palace, all of you. And so they became frightened, which is only natural. And they said, what are we going to say? What are we going to tell him? And so Ja'far said, we will only say what our Prophet told us to say, and we're not going to change the truth no matter what happens. I.e. will speak the truth. And it shows that when Muslims stand up for the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect them and stand up for them. So when they arrived at the palace, they found the Negus surrounded by his advisors, by his, uh, the Arabic word is Batariqa, and Batariqa actually has a, uh, a Latin original which was then made into English which is Patriarch. Uh, the word patriarch is from Batariq, that's the same thing. So the patriarch, patriarchs are uh, basically the senior figures of the religion. right? They are the, the, the ministers. So he was surrounded by the viziers and the patriarchs. This is an official meeting. All the congressmen and senators are present, if you like. They all come to the palace. And you have Amr ibn al-As and you have his companion on one side. And you have Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and the de delegation of the Muslims on the other side. Now, Amr ibn al-As entered first. And him and his companion, as was the custom of, of, of the Najashi, they prostrated in front of him. Because, as with most emperors, even the Roman emperor, the Persian emperor, the Abyssinian emperor, people always prostrated in front of the king. 
This was the common practice of all kings of the time. And, I mean, these people are pagans. If they're prostrating to uh, rocks and stones, prostrating to a living being makes more sense than prostrating to rocks and stones. They don't mind. Who cares? It's just, it's all the same to them. So they prostrated in front of Najashi. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib entered. And he walked in erect, firm. And he did not lower his head one inch. The minister said, how dare you walk in without prostrating to the Najashi. And subhanallah, this was at a time where their life hangs in the balance. Their future in Abyssinia hangs in the balance. But they have a principle. And that principle is, we cannot worship other than Allah and we cannot bow our heads to other than Allah. This is not issue of compromise here. I, we, we, we can't change that. And they're coming at a state of weakness. This is not a state of strength, right? But they're not going to compromise their iman. And so Ja'far says, Our Prophet wasallam has told us that we can only prostrate to our Lord. This is our religion. We can only prostrate to our Lord. And so Najashi says, and obviously all of this is through a translator, because they couldn't speak Abyssinian and he, they could not, he could not speak Arabic. Najashi says, tell me, what is this religion of yours that you have now invented? Now this is, you're showing me this religion by not prostrating. What is this new religion that you have invented? And what is the matter that you have forsaken the religion of your people and you haven't embraced my religion, nor have you embraced the other religions on earth? Right? If you had become Christian, we understand. If you become Jew, there are people that are Jews. But how about this new religion? What is it? And so Ja'far gave that eloquent response that all of you have read and have heard so many times. It is, wallahi, the pinnacle of eloquence. And it shows us why the Prophet ﷺ chose Ja'far to be the leader. Because to be a leader, you need to have a personality. And you need to have eloquence. Without this, you really cannot be a leader. And Ja'far had both, and that's why Ja'far marches in firm. He's not going to bow his head down. Had it been others, maybe they would have collapsed under the pressure. Not Ja'far. And when he was sincere to his faith, that sincerity automatically brings about respect. And you know, the fact of the matter, brothers and sisters, when you stand up for what you believe, even if your opponent doesn't agree with you, they will, in some sense, even if they hate your guts, they must respect you for being firm to your principles. This is just a fact of human life. It doesn't matter whether they agree or disagree. They could hate you more for being so stubborn. But one part of them will respect. And this is what Ja'far is basically doing. He's staying firm to his religion. So Ja'far responds and you know you all know this beautiful passage which really should be read many times and memorized. I'll just narrate it and it's something that we have read since we were kids. Your Highness, we used to be a nation steeped in Jahiliyyah. And we would worship idols. And we would eat this dead meat. You know, an animal dies, we'll eat it. Now, of course, the people of, of Abyssinia are Christians, right? And they have some sense of ethics and morality. And uh, they have some civilization. You know, they have structure, they have buildings, they have society, they have morals. Makkah, as we said over and over again, really and truly was just completely backward. And it's something many Muslims don't, doesn't click for them. Uneducated, backward people, they have no clue what is civilization. So Ja'far is trying to explain, we were basically, you know, jahil, we're living in Jahiliyyah. That's exactly the word he uses. We were living in Jahiliyyah. And we used to perform uh, fahisha. We didn't have a sense of right and wrong. Fahisha means sexual immorality. We didn't have laws, we just go do zina. It's not something we had ethics to do. And we would break the ties of kinship and treat our neighbors in contempt. The strong amongst us would eat up and devour the weak. It was all about who was the stronger one. And we remained in this state until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a messenger to us. Now, again, he's very wise here because the Negus knows what is a messenger. The Quraysh had never seen a messenger. It's not in their culture. The Negus is a Christian. He knows very well what a messenger is, right? And the whole speech of Ja'far shows that he understands the psychology of Negus. And he shows how to give da'wah. So he says, Allah sent us a messenger. This messenger was known to us. He's from our community. We know his house and his lineage. And we know his truthfulness. And he never spoke one lie in his life. And he invited us to believe in one God alone. This is the religion of Christianity and Judaism, monotheism. And to leave idol worship. And he told us 
to abandon the ways of our forefathers that are, uh, and to leave the worship of stones and statues. And he commanded us to be true when we speak and to fulfill our promises and to fulfill the ties of kinship. He told us to be good to our neighbors and he commanded us to avoid all evils. He told us to not spill blood to give true testimony. He forbade us from eating the property of orphans. He forbade us from accusing uh, uh, others of adultery. And he commanded us to worship Allah alone without associating anything with him. He told us to pray and to fast and to give charity. So we believed in him and we followed him and we had faith in him. And we worshiped Allah alone and we gave up worshiping idols. And we forbade upon ourselves everything that he told us to, for, to, to for, uh, forbade. And we made permissible all that he allowed for us. But our people opposed us. And they showed hatred towards us. And they tortured us. And they punished us. And they tried to force us back into idol worship. And they were unjust to us. And they made life miserable. And they prevented us from being who we were. So when they did this, we emigrated to your land. And we chose you above all other rulers. And we wish to come under your generosity and hospitality. And we put our trust in you that we would not be shown injustice in your land, O exalted highness. Now, the whole speech is, you couldn't have invented a better one if you had the imagination and the time to do so. And he did it on the spur of the moment, right? He appeals to the emotions, the justice, the generosity, the common sense, the religion of the Negus. He puts instantaneously himself in the positive and the two emissaries in the negative. In a five minute speech, the whole table has turned. Even the Arabic is eloquent. And this shows us why the Prophet chose Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. And again, the point of praising Najashi. And praising the intelligence and wisdom of Najashi, subhanAllah, it shows you are, you need to appeal to the court of Najashi. And so this speech swayed Najashi and it moved him. And he said to the Muslims, do you have any revelation that this Prophet says he has? Do you have any speech that he says that Allah gave to him? So Ja'far said, yes, I do. And so he said, recite it for me. And so Ja'far ibn Abi Talib recited the beginning few pages of Surah Maryam. And even in this, of course, I mean, it's obvious, the choice here. Could have chosen a million surahs. Well, I'm not a million, but you get my point. Could have chosen so many surahs. But he chose the one surah that talks about the virgin birth, talks about Mary, talks about Jesus. Beautiful. And again, can you imagine the voice of Ja'far booming in the halls of Najashi? reciting Qur'an in that beautiful, melodious voice. All of the priests and ministers, all of the, 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 the elite people are hushed and humbled. And the walls of the palace are reverberating with that tilawa, which must have gone on for at least 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Do the, you know, do the math as they say. Three and a half pages of Surah Maryam would be the story of Jesus, right? And he's reciting all of it. It's not just a one minute thing here. Imagine, again, put yourself in that shoes for 15 minutes. Beautiful tilawa. And obviously, it is said, even as Haq himself says this, that even the, the, the Batariqa, even the patriarchs, without even understanding what was being recited, they were moved to tears. I mean, this is the Qur'an. And we believe the Qur'an has this impact. And so even the patriarchs were moved to tears. And the Jashi himself began to cry. When it was translated to him, he too began to cry. And then he said, I swear by God, this recitation, this tilawa, and the messages of Moses and Jesus have sprung forth from the same fountain. This is the same source. And he spoke to the two emissaries and said, Go away from me, because I'm not going to hand these people over to you, and I'm not even going to think about it, basically. Don't even think about handing these people back. So Amr ibn al-As and his companion exited in humiliation, and as they were leaving, Amr whispered over to his companion and said, don't give up yet. I have one final trick. Tomorrow, I will come back and bring one final trick out of my hat. 
His companion said, now his companion, some people say it was Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah, others say it was his cousin Umar ibn al-Walid. Allahu alam who it was, there's a little bit of a, a difference who the companion was. His companion was the more gentle of the two, and his companion said, leave it, ya Amr. Khalas, leave it. Yani we tried, we failed. Because look, even if we don't agree with them, in the end, they are our relatives. I mean, realize, this is your cousin, your brothers, your uncles, your nephews. They are our relatives. I mean, leave it alone from now. But this is Amr ibn al And at this time, he's not a Muslim. So Amr said that, no, one more attempt. Just wait tomorrow. So the next day, they sought permission again. And the Niga said, what do you want? We already decided. And yani you're not going to get them back. And so Amr said that... Oh, Holy Emperor, we forgot to mention to you one thing, that they say something blasphemous about the God that you worship, Jesus Christ. They didn't tell you that bit. Go ask them what they believe about Jesus Christ. Now, what is blasphemous? He's not the Son of God. Right? This is blasphemous because it's not Christianity. And so, Najashi is now interested. Like, what is this? So, Najashi sent the emissary again on the next day, and said, come immediately to the palace. Come immediately to the palace, we're waiting for you now. We want to know what your position is on Jesus Christ. At this, the Sahaba were struck with terror, much more than they were on the day before. Because now, this is like, come right now. And they know this is now Amr's doing, because what else is going to happen now, you know? And so, once again, they say, what are we going to say, Ya Ja'far? And so Ja'far said, we will say exactly as what the Prophet ﷺ told us to say. And that is that Jesus Christ is the Abd of Allah. He is the servant of Allah, and He is the Rasulullah, and He is the Ruhullah. And He is born of the Virgin Mary. And we will not change this for them. SubhanAllah, He's not going to change what they believe just because He wants to please Najashi. And this is the way of the believer. Because they stood up for the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them. And they went to the emperor again. And by the way, before I move on to the story itself, subhanAllah, one of the most important lessons we learned from this whole story is that the Sahaba used the system of the time to fight the oppression of the time. It's not an Islamic state. Is it? Right? Najashi is not a Muslim. Not now he's not. And they are being charged, if you like, in a manner of the system of Najashi. And I say this because we have some people still left. Uh, you know, honestly, pre-9-11, there were much more. Post-9-11, most of these scholars have had to wake up and smell the coffee. And I speak as being a part of that group that used to say similar things many, many years ago. This ultra-conservative vision of Islam, that's not going to be realistic or practical. There were still people, there are still people who say, you're not allowed to be a part of the system. You're not allowed to be a part of the democratic process. You're not allowed to do this and that. There are still some minority of scholars who say this. Before, for those of you who were active in the past, this used to be much more common. And it was very common to hear, ask the fatwa, is it halal or haram to vote? Right? Now here we find that Jafar ibn Abi Talib is using the system of the land to fight against oppression and to fight for his freedom. Is he not? Right? And nobody is saying, oh, hold on a sec, the ways of Najashi are the ways of Kufr. These are democracy or this or that. No, you have no choice. This is the way you need to fight for the truth. And you have to use the resources given to you. And the, the, the land, that whatever system it has, you use it. And Jafar had no qualms using the system. So we will do the same thing in this land. We will fight against oppression through the courts, through the media, through the public pressure. The same opportunities that everybody has, we too have them. And we must do so like Ja'far ibn Abi Talib did. Ja'far used his opportunities, we need to use our opportunities. And therefore, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib said that we're not going to change the truth. And so they come back to the uh, Najashi and Najashi is a bit irritated and he asks them, what is this that I have heard that you have a blasphemous opinion about Jesus Christ? So Ja'far said, your Royal Highness, we say exactly what our Prophet said. Now notice he said this phrase multiple times. And this also shows us that he's trying to impress upon the Najashi, I am remaining firm to my principles. This is what I believe. And he's quoting what is an evidence for him, and Najashi should understand that it is an evidence for him. 
And we should also not be embarrassed to say the same thing. Why do your women wear hijab? Because our God told them to do so. Why do you pray five times a day? Because our book tells us to do so. This is an evidence that even if you don't agree with the book, you must understand this is a legitimate evidence for us. Correct? Right? It's nothing wrong. And in fact, it's a watertight evidence in its own way. And I've spoken about this in other lectures that I've given. The best evidence that we can give to any non-Muslim is to say, because the Lord that I believe in, who created me, told me to do this and that's why I do it. It's a watertight argument. You cannot attack this argument. You have to go back and say, well, I don't believe in that God. And that's the point we say, yes, you don't. We, we do. It's a different uh, religion. So the point being, he says, our prophet told us that Jesus Christ is the Abd and the Rasul, uh, the Abdullah and Rasulullah and Kalimatullah that he gave to Maryam. Al-Batul Al-Adhra, the, the virgin, the innocent, the chaste uh, Maryam. And that he was a righteous prophet. Now, he stopped there. Notice, and this is a key point as well, that what he said was absolutely true. But he didn't go and be on the offensive and say, and we say that the Trinity is blasphemous. And we say that saying that the Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is insulting, even though that's what the Quran says, right? But he didn't get there because, look, you don't need to go to that level yet. He's not hiding the truth, but he's telling it in a wise manner. And we do have some who really don't understand how to give da'wah. That, look, right now you just need to establish your credentials. He's not lying. Everything he says is positive, but he just stops before he gets to the point of saying, what you guys believe is blasphemous in our religion. He does, there's no need to say that. Right? He says what he believes and Najashi gets the point. You don't think he's the son of God, basically, because he doesn't say that. And even in this is wisdom. That, and I've said this many times before, we're never allowed to lie. But there's also a manner of speaking and an audience in which we speak in. And a methodology and a wording. And Ja'far uses the appropriate wording. And so when Ja'far said the truth, now it comes out, and we can read into the lines here, that... The Negus was not in fact a believer in the Trinity. And he didn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And in this he resembled Heraclius, his contemporary and colleague, the Emperor of Rome. In that, once upon a time politicians were educated, those were fairy tales of the past, they no longer exist in our times. You know, we, we must believe that once upon a time politicians used to be smart people. That was a time long gone. Uh, so politicians actually were intellectuals. And both the Najashi and uh, Heraclius believed in versions of Christianity that their own priests did not believe. And so when Ja'far speaks the truth, Najashi is even more impressed. Because this is what he himself has been believing all this time. And so he picks up a little branch that was in front of him, a twig, and he says, Wallahi, what you have just said does not exceed what Jesus Christ said by this much of a branch. In other words, your message is the message of Jesus Christ. He never said he's the son of God. He never said that he's a third of a trinity. And there are many Christians who secretly believe this or who know this, but then society is simply too much of a, a pressure upon them. And so when he says basically what uh, Najashi himself believes, then Najashi now makes a final decision. And he turns to the emissaries and he says to Amr ibn al-As that be gone from here and take all of your gifts back with you. I have no need for them. He returned the gifts, at least the day before he kept the gifts, right? Now to add insult to injury, right? I don't need your cheap bribes. Go return all of these gifts to them. And so, Umm Salama is narrating all of this, and she concludes by saying, the two emissaries left, humiliated, debased, and degraded. Khalas, that's like, you know, and they've lost everything. Having been returned the gifts that they had come laden with, all that they came with, they went back with. And this is... Really, it's a slap in the face because gifts are typically accepted, right? And the day before, had they left, the gifts would have been there. But now, every gift, even the minister's gifts was returned. Nobody's allowed to take anything from them. And we remained in the land receiving the best hospitality and the most neighborly treatment until we finally returned to the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca. Few more points, uh, inshallah, we'll, we'll go for another 10 minutes and then stop for Isha because uh, we need to finish the story of Najashi. 
Now, when Najashi said this, that he picked up the twig and he said, Jesus Christ never uh, said anything more than this, rumors spread that Najashi has become a heretic. He has abandoned the religion of our forefathers. Najashi has become a heretic. And so, the ministers, and you know how politicians are, I mean, there's always internal battles, and a lot of people, there's always inner struggles and inner cores. So, another group began to speak against the Najashi privately. And they began to taint him that he's not Christian enough. And he has heretical beliefs. And there was a possibility of a coup d'etat. And Najashi is aware of what's happening. He has his own sympathizers telling him. And so one day, he decided to confront that batch of instigators. And he wrote on a parchment, Ashhadu in his own language, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. That I bear witness that, La ilaha illallah, and that Isa is the Ruhullah, and the Karimatullah, and the Abdullah. He's a Christian, this is what he believes, right? And this is what we believe. And he put this parchment inside his robe. You know, he's wearing all of this fine robe. He put it inside his robe. And then he calls these instigators and he brings them into his private chambers. And he says, what is your problem with me? What is the matter? Have I not been a good king to you? They said, yes. Have I not been a just ruler? They said, yes. Have I not improved the situation, this economically, whatever? And overall, everybody loved Najashi. Overall, he was one of the better kings. They said, yes. So he said, what is your problem with me? Come out with it. Tell me what is your problem. And he knows because of the, his own sympathizers. So they finally come out and they say, you have abandoned our religion. And you have heretical beliefs. So he asked them, what do you say? What do you believe? And so they say, we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, He's our Lord, He's our Savior, He's the third of the Trinity, etc. Basically, Christianity. And so, Najashi said, and I swear by Allah that this, and he pointed to the piece of paper, which was on his heart, that this is exactly what I believe. And he left it at that. Now this is of course, Tawriya, complete double meaning, completely, he said something which is true, right? But the way they understood it is completely different, right? I swear by Allah, this is what I believe. And by this, he means what is in the parchment that is next to my heart, right? And so when he swore by Allah that this is what they believe, that he believes, the Christians were satisfied. Because of course, what he had said before was, I agree with you, O Muslims, that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, basically, right? And so when he said this, that that uh, internal struggle stopped. Uh, it is mentioned that before he had this meeting, he sent a messenger, secret messenger to the Muslims. And he said to them that I am having issues and problems, and it is possible that I will be killed soon. So this was a major issue, right? And if you hear news of my death, I have instructed one of my ships to be at such and such a place. As soon as you hear that I have been killed, go to that place, that ship will be yours with its captain. Go wherever you please. But he actually won the battle and so that plan was not needed. But look at how much Iman he had and look at where he, uh, he has thinking about the, the, the uh, Muslims. And Al-Bayhaqi narrates in his Sunan, sorry, in his uh, Dara al nubuwa that the Prophet ﷺ eventually wrote him a letter when he emigrated to Medina. The Prophet ﷺ wrote Najashi a letter and he invited him to Islam. And Najashi wrote back to the Prophet ﷺ saying that, I am a Muslim and I believe in you. And I believe in all that you say. And if you command me, Ya Rasulullah, I will come right now to Medina and serve you. If you command me, I will come right now to Medina and serve you. So Najashi publicly, well not publicly, privately to the Prophet ﷺ, said that he is a, a Muslim. And there's only, I have tried to look as much as I can in the, in the stories of the Sirah for the stories of Abyssinia, because the Muslims lived there for more than 10 years. For more than 10 years, the Muslims were in Abyssinia. In fact, for, uh, 12, 12 years they were in Abyssinia. And unfortunately, we don't have very many stories. There's one more story mentioned about uh, the, the, the Muslims of Abyssinia. Uh, and that is a story that involves a pretender to the throne. Not an internal struggle within the palace. No, another force, another Abyssinian royal family was struggling with the Najashi and trying to seek power in the land. And matters began to get bigger and bigger. 
and it was all heading towards a civil war. And Umm Salama narrates that we began to be scared that Najashi would be defeated and an enemy, our enemy or somebody else would be installed in his place. And we didn't know what to do. And we began making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help Najashi win and remain in power. And the situation finally reached the level that there was a civil war. There was a battle between the two sides. And so we had a meeting in which we said, what are we going to do? And so we said, who is going to find out what happens at the battle so that we hear before somebody else comes and tells us, right? In other words, let some, one of us go and spy on the battle, see who wins, and then if, if uh, the other side wins, we need to get out of here, right? So Zubayr ibn al-Awwam, another cousin of the Prophet and volunteered. And he was, Zubayr is a strong man. And so he said, I volunteer. He packed his stuff, he took some food and, and stuff, and he went. The battle was taking place, the books say, uh, on the banks of the river Nile. The Nile goes all the way down into Abyssinia, as you know. It's not just in Egypt, it keeps on going all the way down uh, to, uh, into Africa. And so the battle was on the banks of the Nile. So Zubayr ibn Awam camped on one side as far away as he could, and he waited to see who would win the battle. And Umm Salama said, in the meantime, we were praying to Allah the most serious prayer. That, oh Allah, allow the Najashi to remain in power and give him tamkeen fil ard, give him authority in the earth. And Zubayr ibn Awam came back in a few days with a great smile on his face and he said, Abshiru, rejoice that indeed uh, Najashi has won the battle and so he will remain in power. And this shows us as well that, uh, I mean, of course, in this era, it's black and white. Najashi is a secret Muslim. The Muslims know this. Najashi will support them. But one important point here, Najashi and his contemporary were not fighting over Islam. This was not a jihad being fought. This was pure politics. Pure politics. And the Muslims sided with one over the other, emotionally. right? Now, they couldn't get involved in any other way because they're not citizens of the land. This is not their war to be fought, right? This is not their battle. Let's extrapolate to 2011, soon to be 2012. There's nothing wrong when there's two parties in the land, one of whom is more sympathetic to Muslims, that you want that sympathetic party to win. And had the Abyssinian Muslims been in a position to help Najashi, do you think they would have not helped him? Right? Of course they would. And again, when you read the seerah, thinking about the modern world changes your whole perspective. It's a matter of survival. This is not just the American way, it is the Islamic way. That when you have an opportunity to defend your rights, to defend your freedoms, you must do so. Whether it's through the media, whether it's through campaigning, whether it's through public awareness, whatever it might be. But there is a party that is sympathetic to your needs. In this case, it's the Najashi. In our cases, we'll talk case by case basis, right? But for sure, one of the two parties in our era, yani they're like leapfrogs. Which one is going to be more Islamophobic? You know, every one of them says every Muslim must be, uh, you know, profiled in the airport. One of them running for president said this, as you know, every Muslim should be uh, profiled. All of them are racist against non-white people, as you know this. Even the one who's not white himself said that uh, he wants a fence that's going to electrocute every single Mexican that dares to cross the border. I mean, this is down insanity, sheer stupidity. It is. Everybody knows this, you know. Everybody's making fun of this. Do you know how much it's going to cost to build a fence to... Anyway, I'm going into my tangent here. But my, my point being, it shows how, you know, my, bringing to reality what is wrong? In fact, it is Islamic that you want a party that will be more sympathetic to you and your rights as a Muslim, right? That you make dua to Allah, that you facilitate the affairs, and more than dua. The Muslims of Abyssinia could not do anything more than dua because they're not citizens, right? They are foreigners, they're on, they're on visa status. It's not their battle to be fought. What if they were citizens? What would they do? Would they just sit on their backs and do nothing? No. Umm Salama said, we were never as terrified as we were when we heard that the Najashi might lose. So they are desperate to get their freedom. Well, we are in similar, well, not, not that similar, but nonetheless, we have some types of similarities here. The final point, inshallah, and then we will uh, conclude that Najashi eventually uh, died uh, a number of years later. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came out one day in Medina, and he said, "Jibril has come and informed me that 
a pious brother of yours has died in a neighboring land. Before anybody could come and tell him, two weeks journey, instantaneously, on that very minute, the Prophet was informed that Najashi has died. And he commanded the Sahaba to come and pray the one and only prayer that was ever prayed in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, Salat al-Janazah al ghaib The only time ever in the history of Islam that the Prophet ﷺ prayed over somebody without a body being present. It's called Salat al-Janazah al ghaib Never before or after except over Najashi. And I've written a long article on this, you can uh, Google it online, or I can send you the link, or maybe you can send it here, about the fiqh of praying Salat al-Janazah over Ghaib. When should it be prayed? Uh, the four methods all have different opinions. The question arises, why did the Prophet only pray over Najashi? Was it because A, he was a famous person? So that any time a famous person who helps Islam, let me say, a famous person who helps Islam, any time a famous person who helps Islam dies, then the whole world should pay janazah al-ghaib over him. Or was it because B, nobody in Abyssinia prayed janazah over him because he was a secret Muslim. And so because nobody prayed over him in Abyssinia, the Prophet prayed over him in Medina. Based on this ikhtilaf, the four madhabs had their own opinions, and even within the four you have more, and this, I have written an article about this, you can find it online. In my humble opinion, uh, the reason is because nobody else prayed over him. And that is because many famous Sahaba died in the lifetime of the Prophet And he didn't pray. And they died in either in battles or in other places. And he didn't pray Janazah uh, over them. And therefore this shows, and Allah knows best, that we pray Janazah, uh, Salat al-Ghaib, over people whose Janazah was not prayed over. But if somebody has prayed janazah over somebody, then uh, it doesn't make sense to pray salat al janazah ghaib. Nonetheless, this is a fiqh issue. Nothing to do with seerah. I'm just saying as a point of interest. Inshallah, we have gone slightly over our time. Uh, we'll take some questions next week. Inshallah ta'ala. Just remember them and write them down. Uh, and there's an announcement to make. And inshallah, I will see you all uh, next week. Inshallah as well. So, go ahead. Yes. Very pertinent question. We're already running late. Inshallah, we'll do a short salah as well then. This is of course the month of Muharram uh, and it is the year 1433. And the month of Muharram is a very uh, special month. It is a month that the Prophet ﷺ has said, he, it is the only month that the Prophet ﷺ has called it the month of Allah. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Shahrullah al Muharram. Shahrullah al Muharram. There is no other month that has been ascribed to. Allah, Shahrullah al Muharram. And Muharram uh, was chosen by Umar ibn al Khattab to be the first month of the calendar year. You all know that the calendar year was decided by Umar ibn al Khattab in the 16th year of the Hijrah. The 16th year of the Hijrah, uh, uh, one of uh, um, Abu Musa al Ash'ari sent a letter to Umar and he said to Umar that, O oh, Umar, uh, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, your letter comes to us, uh, but we don't know when it was written and when you want us to do something by. There's no dates, i.e. So please set for us a schedule or a calendar that we can implement the commands by. And so Umar said this is a great idea. So he called the gathering of the Sahaba and uh, he asked them when, when should we begin our numbering system. And there were many opinions uh, at the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, at the death of the Prophet ﷺ, and at the Hijrah. And Ali said it should be at the Hijrah. Ali ibn Abi Talib suggested at the Hijrah. And he said because this was when Allah changed the situation of Islam from being persecuted to being uh, protected. From being humiliated to being at a state of Izzah. It's the Hijrah. That was when things changed. So let's make the Hijrah the first year. Okay, the Hijrah is the first year. What's the first month? Because they, uh, they don't have a first month, right? The, the, the 12 months, the names were in pre-Islam. But because there's no calendar, no month is the first month. So one opinion says Ramadan, because that's the holiest month. Another opinion says Rajab, uh, because uh, Rajab is the only of the four Ashur al-Hurum that is by itself, right? Another says uh, uh, Dhul Qa'da, uh, another says, sorry, uh, uh, Shawwal. Shawwal, because that's the first 
No, sorry, Dhul Qa'da. Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram. Another says Dhul Qa'da because the three holy months, there's four holy months, Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, and then Rajab by itself. Right? So one opinion was we choose Rajab, another opinion was we choose Dhul Qa'da because that's the first of the three. Another opinion was Dhul Hijjah because that's when the Hajj takes place because there's lots of opinions now. Until finally, it was Umar as well who suggested and others then agreed. Umar said, it shall be Muharram. Why? Scholars have differed, but the why, in my opinion, is very clear. Later scholars have said, because in Muharram, Nuh was saved with the ship, and Musa was saved with uh, uh, Fir'aun. This is all valid, but that's not why Umar ibn al-Khattab chose it. He said very clearly, this is because the Hujjaj returned home, and so basically a new life begins for the Hujjaj. It's a very interesting point here, right? Yani when you come back from Hajj, you turn over a new leaf, right? And so by the Hijjah, when you're in Hajj, now you come home, that's when you change. So it should be when the Hujjaj return, and in those days most of the Sahaba would do Hajj, right? I mean, this is Mecca, Medina, it's not like America and Timbuktu, it's Mecca and Medina. Most of the Sahaba are going for Hajj every year. So every year should be like a new beginning, basically, right? And so Muharram should be chosen as the uh, first of the year. Later scholars then tried to bring it back to the Hijrah that the niyyah to make the Hijrah by the Prophet was actually formulated in Dhul Hijjah and so the first month that was seen was the month of Muharram. But again this is reading back. What Umar himself said makes the most sense. So I've gone into my tangent as usual but inshallah you benefited with this. Uh, Muharram is a blessed month, it is a sacred month. Aisha said that I have never seen the Prophet ﷺ fast in any month other than Ramadan as much as, much as Muharram. And the Prophet ﷺ said that fasting on the 10th of Muharram forgives the sins of the year before. Don't get confused, always the fast of the 9th and 10th of Dhul Hijjah, both years, back and forth. The 10th of Muharram is the year before. Only the year before, which is big enough. We're saying only, but the whole, the minor sins of the whole year. And on this day, as we know, Musa was saved from Fir'aun. Another version adds that Nuh's ship landed on Judi, on Mount Judi. Uh, Nuh's ship, alayhi uh, ship was saved on Judi, and Fir'aun was destroyed on this day. And as for the sad event that happened in Karbala on that day, it is a time of sadness. There's no question about it. But it has nothing to do with the 10th of Muharram being sacred. It was just a coincidence that it happened on that day. And our heart bleeds for the evil that happened. But it has nothing to do with the sacredness and sanctity of that day. That was made sacred before what happened uh, at that instance. And so inshallah, I remind myself and all of you to fast on the 10th of Muharram if it is possible to do.